these are pasture or only grass fed and produce this well marbled beef which is renowned for its flavour and also very healthy. So what's the problem? Well the problem is this, there are many that will turn around and tell us that we're actually stood amongst the climate change's biggest criminals. Why? Well, all that grass, when it goes into the stomach, is broken down by a process called enteric fermentation, which then releases methane, which is 20 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. Hence the problem. However, in this brief, what we're going to do is take a close look at what goes in the front end, what comes out the back end, and then dig a little deeper than most. And I think you might be a little surprised by what we find. But the system, uh, the feed system, where it was supplemented by uh, straw, barley and so on. Now quite clearly the inputs to this system are high. High in energy, fossil fuels and also high in economic costs. If we take a look at the, an extensive system, and here we've got some Welsh blacks on the hills, then the inputs to this grass or the ecosystem or landscape if you will is essentially low input low in terms of energy and also low in terms of costs well what about the greenhouse gas emissions if you compare the two well let's take a look at the english beef and lamb executive who've done a carbon footprinting of uh, beef production more of the intensive and less of the extensive you'll probably be aware of the drive to eat less uh, meat and reduce the number of stock. Well, let's, if we take a look at North America, then the US Department for the Interior report that in 1800, there were some 80 million bison roaming the American prairies. In addition, today the US Department for Agriculture reports that there are now, fundamentally, the changes are down to the way that the animals are reared to the land management, not to the cattle themselves. If we're to seriously address the agricultural emissions and their impacts on climate change, then the focus should clearly be on soils, not on cattle. This slide shows the IPCC. Here you see the many insects that feed off cow pets, which you probably Let's go a little deeper and look underneath the cow pat. This one obviously helped fertilise the soil and encourage a fresh growth of grass. The grass contains a wide range of species of grasses, legumes and wild flowers. And in addition to the cattle, it also supports a diverse ecosystem, biodiversity, which also serves to... Let's dig a little deeper again and find out what else has been going on in the soil. In this block there are three grass fields and if you were to just take a look over the uh, hedge you'd turn around and say it's grassland and indeed DEFRA were just classified as permanent grass but the history of these three fields is actually quite different. The most northerly one last season had all seed rape on it and it's recently been re-drilled with wheat. To the best of my knowledge, this field has been in arable production for over 40 years. It's been well managed in accordance with RB209 and it's had very good yields, three to three and a half tonnes of wheat per acre. So let's dig here and see what we find. But these figures are somewhat at a variance to those that are generally accepted. And indeed they're between five and ten times higher than the typical figures that are used usually in the range of about 0.2 to maybe one tonne of carbon per hectare per annum increase on uh, pasture land. So what are the possible factors then for this higher sequestration rate that we're seeing? With that three tonnes per hectare per annum figure in mind, let's backtrack a fraction and take a look at the per head cattle methane emissions. It works out that not only that, the trees, the grass and the soil is also stashing away the carbon. The cattle, pigs, sheep and fowl are not only eating the byproducts or the waste and grazing the grass, at the same time they're also increasing the soil fertility. 
and as such are an integral part of a low carbon mixed farming ecosystem. With that in mind, now let's go and take another look at that arable field. On the other hand, if that same quarter of a hectare was farmed intensively as monoculture arable to produce wheat, there would be high levels of fossil fuels for and then at the end of that, this quarter of a hectare would produce two, maybe two and a half tons at best of wheat. Of course, there is all the other biodiversity that goes along with this that you can see. Well, with that in mind, now let's go and take a closer look at those soil carbon figures. The wheat field has 53 tonnes of carbon per hectare. Which of course, over the following 20 years or so, resulted in a doubling of wheat yields from 4 to 8 tonnes per hectare. However, for the last 15 years or so, wheat or indeed all crop yields have largely plateaued, as you can see here. Now, what's intriguing is, I said for each economic uh, activity, we would take a look and consider how 50% energy savings might be achieved tomorrow. As a means of stemming the further releases of carbon from our soils and also for recovering carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Rather than cattle being part of the climate change problem, they're actually part of the solution. Beware single issue environmentalism.